Okay, well, welcome back. And uh, we have the, the afternoon panel as the thankless effort of after the meal and in the hot, we're keeping you all awake here, so we'll do our best to keep things rolling and uh, moving. So, hello? Uh, I don't know where was ever on the conference call here. It's, um, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, <clears throat> now for those that didn't see it, I, I actually don't have it in front of me, but uh, Mr. LaRouche put out a statement concerning his birthday, uh, upcoming birthday, which will make him 92 years young, old, however you want to, however Lynn, Lynn seems to be getting younger as he goes. Uh, but he puts out a very clear, I won't say a birthday wish, because I don't think Lynn ever wishes for anything. I think he goes out and makes it happen. Uh, but, it, but this would be also, coincidentally, the, the day, first day back for the Congress. And a very good day to have Boehner gone and Obama removed so that we can get on to business. And I, you know, I think what Phil went through was very sobering on uh, Lynn's view on this question of tragedy. And, and I think you know, each of us in our, in our own sense have, a, have an idea of what it is to organize our fellow American citizens right now. And a, a kind of tragedy that, that most people uh, go through or live through, participate in, because of an inability to see clearly. And now, that doesn't mean we give up. That means we, we push even harder. And, and I think you know, we just have to be clear that what, what Laney went through of a 40-year battle by Lyndon LaRouche, his wife Helga, uh, people like Laney and Phil that have been involved in this fight, especially with China, uh, and the fight for this organization in general, that we are at a point where this can come very rapidly, very, very suddenly. But it will come as we get the, the steel resolved to make it happen. So, and it's not an, a, a timeless fight. This situation is cracking apart at the seams right now. We don't have long before this entire derivatives bubble blows out. I mean, it's, it's in the process of blowing out. And what people think of as value is going to, it, it actually doesn't have any value now, but it will soon be that such on your bank statements, on your stock portfolio statements, on your gold bars that people think they have that represents value, and on your uh, housing price values. All those values are about to go through the floor because there's nothing behind it. And what I would like to get into with this presentation, which I'd like to present something on the question of value. I know Pat has uh, some more to add on this question of the drought, both the seen and unseen elements. And then Jason uh, Ross from the science research team will present a, you know, a picture of what, what it is that we're actually engaged in and working with these other nations to bring about a real renaissance for mankind. And I just want to say one thing on this because I, I have the opportunity to participate in the uh, Pacific Basin Nuclear Conference, which is a uh, you know basically top uh, nuclear engineers, scientists, policymakers on the question of nuclear power from the Pacific Basin. So in the United States, Canada, actually there was no one there from Russia, which I found. Interesting. They, they, could, they didn't even have Russians at their boost for Rosatom, which is their Russian uh, nuclear energy supplier, their uh, uh, company that builds 
nuclear power plants around the world, uh, which I think is obviously probably not disconnected from the political reality and the, the push for war, and Russia feels that, that pressure. Um, but then people from Japan, China, India, Taiwan, Vietnam, Australia. And one of the things that I found most um, interesting was in the dialogue with the participants from China. You know, there's a way where we can kind of romanticize what they're doing, or maybe not romanticize, but we want to give it a certain, uh, a certain gravity of what it represents, a certain power, and you know, uh, that, it, that it is a profound thing that they are that they are up to. But for many of them, it was sort of interesting. The younger ones, it was, hey, this is what we know. This is the culture that we've grown up with. Somebody who's 20 years old or you know, in their 20s is a nuclear uh, physics um, student, has a sense that their life has been in a upward trajectory. And, and it was kind of like, well, what else would you do? <laughs> and for those in their 40s, 40s, early 50s, they had sort of known that China had made a, a, a transition but, and they had a, a kind of a, a more, it was like, yes, we're doing this, again, but what else would we do? But we, we have to do more, because our people are, we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, is what the Chinese, what they were saying. It was, we have more people to pull out of poverty. We have more to do. And it, and it somewhat struck me that they're in the middle of this, and for them, it's, well, yeah, but we also have more to do. And, and I think, you know, what Phil brought up as the, the can-do spirit, we do have to pull out in our fellow Americans the residual that does lie, however beat down and buried it may be, especially with the last 14 years of fascism, uh, we have to pull that out of them. Now, what I'd like to do is just present uh, something on the question of value, because uh, Mr. LaRouche has recently called for a, an international series of conferences to discuss the notion of value. And I want to read what he responded um, in some discussions a, a few weeks back when he was asked on this. He says, on the question of these international conferences to discuss value. He said, if you are not dealing with China's thermonuclear capabilities, you're dead meat. Because only in what China represents so far, China actually is collecting a source of thermonuclear power, which is not available at this time to any other part of the planet Earth. And therefore, China's dominant role in terms of its thermonuclear capabilities is the leading force throughout the entire planet Earth right now. Now there are other things that are relevant to that which are brought into play because of it. Once we get into cooperation with China on this moon project, the China Moon Project is the future of mankind. And it's only to the extent that we mobilize ourselves behind that and then look to other inferior means which can be mixed with the international thermonuclear capabilities to mix these capabilities and their applications and sort them out for the world as a whole. We're not going to do anything for thieves in the United States to hell with them. So he goes on to discuss this as a, as a science driver uh, program and, and then comes back to the question of the four laws and in particular this notion of real value. Uh, the so-called productive powers of, of labor. It says, we must eliminate all of what we are used to as cheap labor and the practice of cheap labor in the United States. We must cancel all cheap labor programs. The only condition on which we can modify that policy is to say we're going to quickly do something to turn what is now cheap labor, non-productive labor, and to turn it as rapidly as possible into productive labor of a high energy flux density. If we don't do that, we're finished. If you do not follow my program, in short, you're finished. 
all those who, who are advocating lower energy de flux densities, lower productivities, they are your enemies. They are the people who are poisoning you. They are the people who are killing you. They are killing your children just by doing that. This means that you need all kinds of health care also. Because without the health care programs, with what goes with them, you cannot produce a highly productive situation. But all we need is to unite a group of nations on Earth together today with China and others who are cooperators on this thing to make things happen that increase the energy flux density of man's productive powers of labor. And anyone who's trying to do something to make it a little cheaper, to make it simpler, should in a sense be taken into a little room and talked to for a while. And I can tell you I've been on the other side of the talking to of of uh, Mr. LaRouche, and uh, it's not so fun. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so that's what I'd like to get at. What is this question of value? It's not an, uh, an unimportant question to ask right now because we're about to see the greatest wiping out of what people think of as values in the transatlantic system. On the other hand, we are beginning to see a concert of nations around the BRICS plus, 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 plus. It's like daily a, a pylon of more nations uh, that are joining the BRICS and the, and the New Development Bank, um, as Laney went through, you know, which is a direct outgrowth of what Lynn has done for this 40-year period. But we, we, do, we do see that there are now two uh, systems of val value. And on the one hand, the only way that the British, the British Empire knows that their values are also punk. And that's the point. They, what they intend is to maintain the values by accelerating the, the killing, by accelerating the, the collapsing of the very means of production. Uh, and by further destroying the, the productive powers of labor of the citizenry of, of nations all across the planet. Uh, however, they're in a bit of a bind because they needed to loot the full six billion people on the planet, the, the six billion that they intend ultimately to loot so far that they will have exterminated that amount of people because that's been their stated intention all along is to reduce population from 7 million to less than 1. So, but now you've got a different situation. Russia, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, and this growing concert of nations have said no. And it is in explicit terms. Um, I, the, this, the quote by this uh, vice president of Bolivia, right now, keep in mind, this is Bolivia. This is a landlocked nation that has zero power, that has been a victim of the Washington Consensus, as it's known, which was the IMF and related policies that came in after the fall of the Bretton Woods system and destroyed South America, as it did many other nations. And here Bolivia is saying, no, we want nuclear power. Now, first off, that's a shock in and of itself that they're saying that, but the quality of language that was used, the Vice President of Bolivia just, he said, look, it's time to break the mental and colonial chains that have kept us down. And that's the spirit that is now being unfolded. That's the spirit we're seeing in Egypt. That's the spirit we're seeing in Vietnam, where they, uh, again, Vietnam expressing solidarity with Argentina on their fight with the vulture funds. You know, it's, it's, it's a pylon for humanity. And Lynn is absolutely at the center of it conceptually and in terms of the actual policy. So now, but I want to make a point on this because the, the present system is over and we will have to discuss a new concept of value, but in that context, it's useful to think about what the end of this system actually is, when it actually began. And largely it began with the fall of the Bretton Woods system. Okay, now, that was 1971. 
they they broke with a what amounted to be a, a kind of a, a fixed exchange rate between nations. So there was a there was a, a peg by which nations knew that their currencies would remain relatively stable, and they could take on long term you know debt and so forth. A thirty year project, they could finance that and know that their payment schedules would remain stable. But when in 71, when the fixed exchange rate was broken, then you had the ability for currency speculators to move in. Now, at the same time, what happened to the US dollar was what was known as the, the petrodollar, right? Where international transactions in oil were now denominated in, in dollars. But what that did is it actually destroyed the sovereignty of the US dollar and turned the dollar into a kind of a, a vehicle of the Anglo-Dutch oligarchy. That's, that's the bigger point. It's not that everything became about oil. It was that they, they set up a, a process by which that defined the financial system and the means of speculation around the commodities and as well brought in the environmentalism, right, which was the the way that the British knew that if they kept everything at a zero growth rate and controlled the commodities and controlled the access to resources, controlled the access to energy, shut down nuclear power, shut down the space program, shut down the, the, the push towards fusion, they know that they could get their ultimate aim, which was to dominate all peoples on the planet and erase the uh, map of any sort of national boundaries for the policy of the British Empire. Right? So that, that's what was brought in. Now at the same time, this question of the petrodollars is not insignificant because this is how they set up the whole BAE system, the, the terrorist system of the Anglo-Dutch oligarchy. Right? They, what, not to get too much into it, but they set up a, a, a spot market and had a deal where between the Saudis and the British aeronautics and engineering firm, BAE Systems. They make fighter jets and all kinds of different you know, military hardware. And they had a deal with the Saudis that they would provide Saudi Arabia with fighter jets. And in payment, Saudi Arabia would make payments in an oil tanker every day over to London. Now, BAE Systems was not really like a defense company per se. It was more of a, an imperial operation. And they had people from British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell, board members that would then take the price of the oil tanker coming over, speculate on the price of that oil, drive up the prices, and create a untraceable cash flow that then was deposited into an account. So then the next day, another oil tanker, more cash. Next day, another oil tanker, more cash, more cash that no one knew about. And by some estimates, people think that this got as high as 100 billion. Some people think it goes into the trillions of dollars that was used to finance all kinds of dirty operations, all kinds of terrorist operations. Osama bin Laden, 9-11 uh, was financed with this kind of money. And, and that, so if you look at this as an integrated system of terrorism, of the control of resources, the control of energy, and probably more importantly than any of us realize is the environmentalism, which systematically shut down any concept of progress that actually does define value. So that's the system that we're now seeing the, the end of. That's what's behind ISIS. That's what's behind this uh, global chaos operation that the British intend to grind down the, the planet. Okay? So now that, that whole thing, that whole system really came in with a whole wave of assassinations. And I won't go too much into it, but we know the names. We know the important names here of John F. Kennedy, his brother Robert. You know, if you think of the 70s, 
that, or I'm sorry, the 60s that led up into the 1971 with the, the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system, the breakdown of any sort of equitable system amongst nations. During those years of the 60s, you had assassinations around the planet. Kennedy, his brother Robert, Martin Luther King, a very important figure that could have, who knows, become the next president of the United States. Uh, globally, you had assassination attempts on Charles de Gaulle. You had uh, Aldo Moro. I mean, the, the list goes on. And I guarantee you that Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles, and Dulles was, Alan Dulles was the head of the CIA, uh, and I believe at that time was the head of the CIA International Assassinations Bureau. So I, I guarantee you they were uh, up to their neck in all of that. And that was to wipe out the leadership that represented an anti-imperialist tradition, which Kennedy explicitly was, De Gaulle explicitly was, and to then usher in this new era that is now coming to an end. So now that it's coming to an end, number one, we've got to think of what the new system represents. Now, and on that note, discuss what a system of value is. So now just to ask a question, does, do you think that means that we're now going to, instead of the petrodollar, it's now time to set up the helium three dollar? In other words, do you think it is the helium three that's the value? That's the actual value? I'm just going to ask that because I, I imagine if they, I mean, you know, there is a way where you try to map on the old system to the to the new system. I, I imagine like, um, you know, spot markets on helium three, you know, trying to delay the shipments of the helium three back from the moon. You know, maybe the like they have pirates now, right? Usually financed by to play around and manipulate wars. You know, maybe we'll cause wars amongst the aliens in the future. And, uh, you know. Anyway, that's. I, it's not going to quite work like that. And so I'd like to just get at the question of what is actually value, what actually should determine the, the sense of value. And so I want to just try something out here and maybe pose it as a, as a kind of a, uh, a thought object. And it's, it's one of these concepts that is simple but not necessarily easy. That those are probably the best uh, concepts in the world that are, you have to think about it a little bit. So and maybe, maybe it won't be as um, tricky or, or people might, might get it quickly. But, um, but anyway, I want to pose a, a way to think about value. And uh, maybe we'll start out here. I want to show a few uh, images. And I, w I want you to think about, you don't necessarily have to answer out loud, but think about what the difference between the images that I'll be showing here. Okay, so now what I want to ask is to think about the relationship of this bridge that we see right here. Okay, it's, it, it, if you could, if you could bundle it all up, if you could take the wood all apart, it would weigh a certain amount, right? And it would have a certain density, it would have a, a, a volume based on that, how much it weighs, right? But you see that it's capable of doing work. And you see the one guy is a benefic beneficiary of the work that the bridge is doing, keeping him elevated. And you might be able to drive a horse across it, but I bet if it came to you guys making the decision to drive your car across it, you might think twice about it, right? So there, there's sort of a limit by what kind of work it can do based on its design, and its, which is related to its ability to do the work, and its weight and so forth, right? Okay, so we're going to go on to look at another bridge. Okay, so here, this one looks more, probably drive your car across that, no problem. 
And it's also, it looks pretty heavy, huh? If you, if you bundle that one up and add its weight, it would be, probably be a lot more dense per unit of weight than the other bridge, because wood is more porous, more airy, versus metal, very, very dense, right? So this one, per unit of weight and density, could probably do a lot more work than the other one, right? Okay, so now, keep this one in mind, it's also very heavy. Let's go on to the next one here. Okay, now this one is almost two and a half miles long. It's somewhere in Japan, uh, the Honshu, the, some island in Japan. And I would bet most of us would think back to the one we just saw, the metal bridge. And if we tried to build a metal bridge like that last one, as long as two and a half miles, you might get into some questions of whether it could actually even be done. The kind of weight that it would even have upon its own self, would it then, if you're trying to have that bridge do work, could it even do the work that this could do? In terms of being able to load it up with various types of vehicles, that trucks, whatever, right? <coughs> okay, so just kind of think on that. We're going to go to the next, uh, the next series of examples on this. Okay, so now we're switching to, switching gears here. Okay, so this is a sculpture, obviously. This is, a, I think, from about 590 BC, the Kuros sculpture, somewhere in ancient Greece. I won't just kind of think about it, and we'll go on to the next one. Oh. Okay. Okay. So why don't we go? Just all right. Just kind of take a look at this one, and then we're gonna go jump back to the other one. Okay, so you notice the difference. And now, now we have to kind of think about work a little bit differently. Because these are about the same stone, you know, it's going to be the same weight, probably about the same size, you know. But now there's a different quality of work that's being done. A little jump forward. So that you see. And then this, so this is from uh, 450 BC, about uh, you know, 150 years later. Than the other one. And now we go to the next one. Okay, so again, still stone, probably about the same size, same density, but look at the amount of work that's being done, because you all can look at this thing and immediately get gripped by trying to figure out all, all of what is happening here. There's far more happening, there's, there's more uh, motion, more its ability to communicate and do more per unit of mass is even more profound, right? So, so anyway, so what I want to just, just to sort of continue the concept, because I think as well, if you begin to just sort of think along these lines, you could look at music in the same way. You could look at the development of, of compositions ability to communicate more musical ideas per, per piece. You see the progression from, from uh, it's some of the interesting progression, the way that Mozart would quote Bach, and the way that Beethoven would quote Mozart, would quote Bach, 
and you see that there's a certain development and ability to do more. So you could really just kind of take this idea in a number of different venues. So, so I want to just come back just to kind of think about this economically. You know, in reflecting on a helium-free economy, just thinking of this ability to do work per unit, just to kind of go through it, we just take oil, natural gas, and coal as a kind of a thought on it here, okay? So, and I, and I don't, don't quote me on this as gospel. I, these are numbers I worked out. They're probably pretty close. Um, there may be factors to it, but uh, global oil consumption last year, I believe it was, was about 32 billion barrels. Uh, that's as a, a 1.3 trillion gallons. That's a lot. Now, it may not necessarily, I'm going to show you on that, but in terms of what it would look like, this is a average sized oil tanker. 32 billion barrels would take about 50,000 of these oil tankers. Okay, so if you, if you put them end to end to end to end to end, it would go about 7,750 miles, or 7,500 miles. Okay, natural gas is about 115 trillion cubic feet. Now, when you liquefy it, you, you condense it quite a bit. But if we were to transfer it on a, a liquefied natural gas tanker, these things here. If you put all of that in the condensed global natural gas, most of it goes through pipelines, right? But if you put it all on, a, on these kind of tankers, it would, it's about 39,000 of these tankers, which if you line them up end to end is, again, about 7,000 miles, right? So in other words, just between Oil and liquefied natural gas, you have a end-to-end-to-end -end -to -end tankers that goes almost 60% around the world. Okay, now coal is about 7.8 billion tons. And a coal car handles about 120 tons of, uh, of coal. So if you put all the end coal that we use in a year on the planet into end-to-end -end coal cars, it's uh, 650,000 miles, a little over than that, which means you'd be going around the Earth 26 times. Okay, so now just think about all of that in your head, like what it would actually take to get all that out. How much of mankind's labor, how many people working at coal mines, how many and then that's not even to add the other factor, which is you gotta get trucks, you gotta get manufacturing equipment. If you think about all the that's involved in that versus what apparently is three shuttle loads of helium three to and this is not even the other forms of, of, of energy. Oil, you know, oil liquefied natural gas, or, you know, natural gas and coal, There's, this is not even, the global energy consumption could be solved with just three shuttles. Um, and then we didn't even get into nuclear, we didn't even get into one of the windmills, solar panels, or any of that. But if you think about how much work is being done with all that, relative to this, three shuttle loads. But then you have to ask more, so, okay. If, on the, the question of value then, what 
what is the actual value? In other words, is it the helium-3 that's the value? Or is it your ability to organize your physical economy? And you know, if you just think about this, how much of, to get three shuttle loads of, of helium-3, how much of your economy is now directly defined around using your mind? Right? The engineering, the machining, the, the science that goes into it. How much relative use of the, power, the human mind relative to the physical output versus an economy of hydrocarbons? It's probably almost an absolute inverse, really, in terms of a relationship. So the question is, what defines the value? Is it the stuff? Is it the coal? Is it the oil? Is it the, the helium-3? Or is it the human mind, which can make breakthroughs, but breakthroughs in a specific direction? So, so anyway, I, I just wanted to throw that out as that I don't think value is, lies in the things in and of themselves. Value actually lies in the process of transformation of your society. And as this progression shows, the ability to do more work with less is actually a principle of the universe. It's really the principle of least action. Leibniz was probably the first one that Laney referred to, uh, or Free Leibniz was probably the first one to really identify it as such. And that, that principle, I would actually say, is the value in an economy. And your ability to progress according to that principle is actually a moral and spiritual issue. Because what do you have to do? You have to make the future better. You have, to, you have to improve your capabilities. You have to improve your scientific capability. You have to apply those uh, creative breakthroughs to new technologies to actually enhance the future of your society. And that's both what makes people happy, but it's also what gives people a sense of participation in the future. And, you know, I think that's what we're beginning to see right now with this unfolding uh, development. I can guarantee you that the people of Egypt, as they're buying in to the, to the bonds and the debt certificates, whatever you want to call them, to finance their own future development, and as they're calling on the youth of their country to come out and build this, and as they're doing this in a context where the British Empire is trying to unfurl chaos around them, that what they're doing as per that commitment to the future is the only way that we can ever solve any of these things. It's the only way you're gonna recruit people out of terrorist death cults and these kind of things. And it's the only way that you can bring a nation together. So I think I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, but I think that at least gets to this question of the productive powers of labor. It's, it's not what your labor is doing at any one moment. It's what the power of creativity acting through the labor is, is doing, and that has a direction to it. So, so anyway, we can probably have more of a discussion at the end. Um, and we'll open it up for Pat. Pat has been working with Mr. LaRouche for a long time, 40 years. Six or seven hundred. And uh, <laughs> Pat,
Well, I think Dave gave a fairly good introduction and opening for me, and I want to introduce to you uh, Vladimir Gradovsky here, the famous Russian-Ukrainian scientist whose work and ideas have been featured prominently on the Rushpak website again and again. And what Gradovsky did is he identified the biosphere as the most powerful force shaping the geology of our planet. That is, up until an even more powerful force emerged, that of mankind. With man, Vernonsky demonstrated that the shaping of the biology and the biosphere itself is now governed by scientific discovery, by culture, and by the development of the sharing of ideas. Now while the biosphere largely created our climate, our weather, the, the, uh, the water cycle of evaporation and precipitation, Man only does what nature cannot do, and that is to consciously direct the flows of water on our planet. Vernotsky identified the evolution of the biosphere and the self-evolution of mankind as a universal as the expression of a universal principle of development, of progress. And he demonstrated further that those species or those cultures which do not progress, which do not increase their energy flux density of activity, will go extinct, which is probably the best argument against environmentalism. Because an environmentalist program must be classified as a self-extinction program. So man is not only created by nature, but in fact is nature's most perfect creation. Because it is only mankind that can intervene in the universe and actually change and shape and reshape that universe. So it is that creative power given to man, the power to adjust nature to mankind's ends and destiny that is, that is driven by mankind's ability to discover those fundamental principles of the universe itself. Now, one year ago, I presented a report on the California drought and the California water management system. And in that report, I forecast that by this summer, California would be in the worst drought in its history. And of course, that's where we are now. So I want to go through exactly what we are facing. Now, as Dave mentioned, it might have been mentioned earlier by Phil, LaRouche yesterday said, this is a serious situation, and people should take this seriously. But it's also tragic. It's tragic from the standpoint that we have not done what we should have been doing. So the tragedy is brought on, brought on by our own free will, our own free choice. And it's time now to make another free choice to end that tragedy, to once and for all turn our nation toward what LaRouche has again and again presented us with as a policy and a program that our friend Vernovsky 
could have been very, very happy with. So here's, here's a graphic picture of the progress of the growing intensity of the California drought. And this is just in the last year. The darker the color, the more intense the drought. And here's the drought monitor from last week. Now, when this this is it's been it's looked like this for the last month now. And what you can clearly see is the extremely dark areas, which in fact cover about 58% of the state. The extremely dark area is called exceptional drought. The red area is called extreme drought. And the other colors are somewhat milder drought. But between the red and the very dark red, it's over 80% of the state in extreme or exceptional drought, the two highest categories. Now, until this year, California did not have even 1% of the state ever in exceptional drought. And when the, when the uh, uh, portion of the state went from 36% in exceptional drought to 58% about a month ago, literally hysteria broke out. Headlines in the state's press, for example, read one doomsday trigger for mega drought in California. California drought just got absolutely terrifying. California drought, we may have to migrate people. Right? Now, you know, the way the media plays things, they, they like to throw a little hysteria in here. But in this case, that you know, hysteria is actually warranted. And it's not just California. 30% of the country is in drought. Some areas, like the entire state of Oregon, are in serious drought. Uh, Texas, of course, has been in and out of drought for the last decade. And the Colorado River Basin has been in one form of drought or another for 14 years. This is a real threat. Since the dozen or so states in the West that are suffering drought, over half of the beef cattle in the country are produced in those states. Half of the vegetables, half of the fruits, and more than half of the winter wheat. Now here's a series of pictures that demonstrate what the drought looks like. That is, what you can see. And I think with the first one, sometimes warning signs really are not necessary. On the other hand, sometimes they may not, they seem not to be necessary, but I'm sure you've all, all, all have met someone who may not pay attention to this sign. Now this is Folsom Dam and Lake, you know. A picture taken three years ago and a picture taken this summer. This is Lake Mead behind the Hoover Dam. Lake Mead is at the lowest level 
it has been since the lake began filling up with water in 1937. And when you travel through the Central Valley, you will see dead trees quite frequently. This is an orchard that is no longer going to produce fruit or nuts. Lake Oregon on the Feather River, a tributary of the Sacramento River. 160 feet below sea level, below its normal or average level. Right? Now, Oroville Dam is the highest dam in the continental United States. You know, so, uh, now here you also have another picture of Oroville Dam. Hmm. 2011 and 2014, I mean, Lake Oregon. Now today, there's 38 million people in California. The state is in, officially, the third year of drought. A drought that has idled more than 500,000 acres just in the Central Valley and thrown out of work more than 20,000 farm workers, the rationing of water has already begun in some towns in California. Uh, Porterville, near Bakersfield, last week, you had 300 homes whose wells suddenly went completely dry. And emergency bottled water is being carried in by various agencies. There's only one year supply of water in the reservoirs of California. No, but last year at this time, there were two years supply. And if there is inadequate rain and snow this coming winter, the California's reservoirs, all of them, will be completely empty. And those 38 million people depend upon those reservoirs being full. The forecast is it might rain this coming winter, it might not. And that's the usual kind of weather forecast you get, isn't it? Now, the two major state and federal water projects, the Central Valley Project and the California Aqueduct, one completed about 70 years ago, the other completed about 40 years ago, declared earlier this year that they would not, they would deliver zero water to anyone through the course of this entire year. This has never occurred in, in the entire history of these two great projects. But later, they uh, changed that. They will deliver 5% of what people normally get, but it will not be till September or October, maybe. Tens of thousands of acres of fruit and nut trees have already just died from lack of water, or the orchardist has already ripped them out, ripping out maybe half of his acreage in order to ensure that the other half will have enough water to survive this summer. Now, that's what you've been able to see. Now, what you don't see can be even worse. Groundwater, the pumping of groundwater uh, normally supplies about 30% of the water needs for the entire state. This year, it's heading towards 70%. Now, that means the aquifers are being drawn down at an alarming rate, with wells running dry, scattered throughout the state, and obviously more wells to go dry as we continue. In some areas, the water table has been falling by as much as two feet per week. 
right? Which means what? That your well you know, will have to be deepened. So now if you want to hire a drilling rig to deepen your well or drill a new one, you're out of luck. Because every drill and rig in this state is booked solid for the next two years. Now some farmers have been trying to purchase water from those who still have a little bit. The price of water has gone from about $200 an acre foot to $2,000 an acre foot since just since last year. And that will obviously You'll pay that only if you can find someone who has some extra water. And as the farmers will tell you, well, the crops that did get planted this year are fairly healthy. The problem, the real problem, will be become apparent next year. Because the, the moisture content of the soil is being depleted so severely that by next year, there will be virtually no uh, water content in any of the Central Valley and much of the rest of California. Still, you know, even though most of the crops that did get planted and harvested have been fairly healthy, some crops almost completely failed. California's cherry crop, for example, completely collapsed. We harvested this year 10% of what we normally harvest in terms of cherries. Now, what's the response to all this? How about the political class? How about the, the state assembly? How about the water managers, the people that run the water management system? Well, the political class and many, many of the water managers, especially those who don't want to rock the boat and have their uh, career potentially threatened, what do they tell us to do? Pray for rain and conserve water. But, you know, praying for rain, I mean, what if God doesn't like you? <laughs> and how in the hell are you going to conserve water if it isn't there? Now, a lot of the Republicans, especially in the Central Valley, are saying what we have to do is build more dams and more reservoirs to be able to capture the rain when it does come again. But of course, that's assuming it's going to come again. Right? Because if we look, over, look at the climate for the Southwest, especially California, over the last 2,000 years, what do we see? That most of that 2,000 years has been characterized by one mega drought after another. Droughts lasting 10, 20, 50, even 100 years. And they, they would be interspersed with something just as bad, which is huge mega storms and mega floods. You know, for example, the last real mega flood in California was 1861, and the entire Central Valley was under 10 feet of water for months. You know, the city of Sacramento was under 20 feet of water for several months. That's 1861, and that was not the biggest mega flood. So, as we look at you know, the future here, what is the forecast? Well, if you look at the last 100 to 150 years, as part of this 2,000 year period, what do we find? That this 100, 150 years has been the wettest and most mild climate of that entire 2,000 year period history. And what we may be entering is back to the normal climate of this region, which is one mega drop after another. A new study released this week, which uh, 
I don't have too much respect for because it's really an argument uh, promoting the idea of man-caused global warming, but it does make the point that we may be entering a mega drought and we may just be in the third year of a 10 or 20 or 50 year drought right now. And what would that mean? Well, think of a picture in your mind of the, the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Right? Have that in your mind. Now, and that was like four years in some areas, and eight years in another. You know, no rain, and the soil, the topsoil just blew away. Well, we're already threatened with dust storms in the Central Valley, right? because the soil is so dried out. So the question is, you know, what would our friend Vernadsky do? Hmm? Well, he would do what we used to do. That is simply that. And a little more, but I want to deal with what we used to do first. We used to take the existing water cycle, which is driven by the sun, and accelerate it, creating water management systems. That is, we would build canals and dams and reservoirs, pipelines, you know, and that was, and you put it all together and it's called a water management system. What man does is he increases the water flux density of a generally diffuse resource, water. Very diffuse, but it is not, it, you know, it's not a rare element. You know? It's everywhere. Two-thirds of the earth is covered with oceans. Okay? What man does is, is apply his creative power to actually move water to where it is needed. And why do we need to do that? Because nature doesn't put it where mankind needs it, and we have to give nature a little hand. Right? That's, that's our intervention. Now, an environmentalist may protest that that's not natural. You know? Well, look at it. Beavers build dams, just like mankind. Which one's not natural? In the 1930s, Franklin D. Roosevelt built the Tennessee Valley Authority. And, and he built the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State. And what both of these dams and the reservoirs do is they control a, the flow and the utilization of a single river. Also in the 1930s and the 1960s, Roosevelt and then Governor of California, Pat Brown, built the California Water Management System, incorporating not one river, but all the rivers of the entire Southwest into one system. The three major rivers and all their tributaries, the Sacramento, the San Joaquin, and the Colorado. The, uh, uh, and this system, which was completed in 1973, provides the water for 38 million people here in California, irrigates millions of farmland, and was, when completed, the largest and most complex water management system on the planet Earth. And it still is today, at least for another year or two, until China completes its system called Move South Water North. Okay. Now, the reason this drought has been so destructive right now is that because in 1973, when we completed the California Water Management System, 
we stop building anything. There have been nothing, there has been nothing built in water management in this state for over 40 years. Now, here's the California water management system. I'm not going to go through it. I'll just say that the, uh, the Central Valley Project and the California Water Project both begin up north of Sacramento, up high in the Sierras, and move water down into the Bay Delta, and the, and the, the uh, uh, Central Valley Project delivers water to the entire Central Valley. The California Aqueduct delivers water both to the Central Valley and to Southern California. And in fact, if you have a picture in your mind of the Rose Bowl, what it looks like, how big it is, that the California State Water Aqueduct fills the Rose Bowl every two hours. That's how much water is coming from Northern California down here. Now, when the California uh, water management system was nearing completion, those who would think ahead thought, what do we do next? And the proposal was the North American Water and Power Alliance, which I think most of you are familiar with, so I'm not going to go through it. But uh, you know, that would have been a continental water management system. So we go from one river to entire regions river systems to a continental water management system. That was the idea. That's the Vernovskian idea. But now we understand that we're going to have to think much bigger than merely a small, a mere continental water management system. Because we have to think on the scale of the solar system. Since processes in the solar system like solar activity are, the, are what has the most dramatic effect on the climate and on the weather here on Earth. And we cannot assume that the precipitation patterns that exist way up in the far northwest, Alaska and British Columbia, those patterns today will be what they would be 20, 30 years from now, because when we look through the historical record, we see dramatic changes in climate and weather caused by the solar cycle, by a, by a uh, solar system or galactic effects that are then made apparent here on Earth. And these dramatic climate changes will occur in the future. So it's possible that 20 years from now, when the Dawapa will be completed, the water up north might not be as available as it is right now. And, and you know, man, there are some things that mankind does not understand fully. And sometimes those areas we do not understand are more important than the ones we already do. And climate is clearly one of those. Because, I mean, think about it. The weatherman on your local TV station will give you a forecast of three, five, maybe ten days, and, up, and up go, any, go any further than that, and he's going to be wrong. Right? We cannot forecast the weather. You know, ten days through the future, very accurately. And so where in the hell do these people who talk about man-caused global warming get away with forecasting the weather 50 years from now? Hmm? Now the current drought is so urgent, we must do something now. And that something is to finally carry out what President John Kennedy had already put in motion. First was Nawapa. Okay? And the other was a massive building 
of a nuclear-driven desalination program for especially California, Texas, but also the rest of the country. And Kennedy created that program in 1963. And in 1964, even after he had been assassinated, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which manages all the water for, from Ventura all the way to San Diego, okay? but the, the uh, Metropolitan Water District signed a contract with the Atomic Energy Commission to begin building the first plant of nuclear-powered desalinization, which would have been completed and pumping a river of water into Los Angeles in 1970. 44 years ago, the first one would have been completed. But that, you know, so what do we need today? Well, we need about 100 of these nuclear power desalination plants just on the California coast. But that's only just a beginning. Think what the effect would have on the entire economy, on our entire culture, as you put millions of people to work building nuclear power desalination plants, the canals, the storage reservoirs required to, to move and, and, and handle the water. Okay? That would be a revolution in itself. Now here is the Carlsbad desalinization plant now under construction just north of San Diego. This plant will produce 53 million gallons of water a day when completed in a little bit over a year from now. And, you, and some of you may be thinking, wow, 53 million gallons of water a day. You know, that's a lot of water. Well, 53 million gallons a day makes up about 7% of San Diego's daily consumption. Right? So one gas-powered desalinization plant is not really going to solve any problems. And it, the, uh, but nuclear desalination, you know, that's the first Vernatskian solution, but it's not enough. As Ben Dennison has reported on the LaRouche Pack weekly program, you know, it will only be with fusion, the development of nuclear fusion, and the tremendous increase in energy flux density that will give us the quantity and more importantly the quality of energy and power required to give mankind the potential to control and shape the weather and the climate and determine by our deliberative creative action when and where rain shall fall. We will create our own water uh, cycles. We will do what only the sun does today. We shall go from managing river systems to managing more and more the actual physical processes of the planet itself. A big step toward what mankind's destiny must be. Managing the solar system, demonstrating that man is the metric of the universe itself. This is the real Vernadskian solution, the creative solution. And here, is where the solution to the California water crisis is to be found. Mining helium-3 on the moon. Thank you. Yeah. And on the one hand, the only way that the British, the British Empire knows that their values are also pumped. And that's the point. They, what they intend is to maintain the values by accelerating the 
the killing by accelerating the, the collapsing of the very means of production, uh, and by further destroying the, the productive powers of labor of the citizenry of, of nations all across the planet. Uh, however, they're in a bit of a bind because they needed to loot the full six billion people on the planet, the, the six billion that they intend ultimately to loot so far that they will have exterminated that amount of people because that's been their stated intention all along, is to reduce population from seven billion to less than one. So, but now you've got a different situation. Russia, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, and this growing concert of nations have said no. And it is in explicit terms. Um, I, the, this, the quote by this uh, vice president of Bolivia, right? Now, keep in mind, this is Bolivia. This is a landlocked nation that has zero power, that has been a victim of the Washington consensus, as it's known, which was the IMF and related policies that came in after the fall of the Bretton Woods system and destroyed South America, as it did many other nations. And here Bolivia is saying, no, we want nuclear power. Now, first off, that's a shock in and of itself that they're saying that, but the quality of language that was used, the Vice President of Bolivia just he said, look, it's time to break the mental and colonial chains that have kept us down. And that's the spirit that is now being unfolded. That's the spirit we're seeing in Egypt. That's the spirit we're seeing in Vietnam, where they, uh, again, Vietnam expressing solidarity with Argentina on their fight with the vulture funds. You know, it's, it's, it's a pylon for humanity. And Lynn is absolutely at the center of it, conceptually and in terms of the actual policy. So now, but I want to make a point on this because the, the present system is over and we will have to discuss a new concept of value, but in that context it's useful to think about what the end of this system actually is, when it actually began. And largely it began with the fall of the Bretton Woods system. Okay, now. Okay, well, welcome back. And uh, we have the, the afternoon panel as the thankless effort of after the meal and in the hot, we're keeping you all awake here, so we'll do our best to keep things rolling and uh, moving. So, hello? Uh, I don't know where was ever on the conference call here. It's, uh, Yeah. Okay, so um, <clears throat> now for those that didn't see it, I, I actually don't have it in front of me, but uh, Mr. LaRouche put out a statement concerning his birthday, uh, upcoming birthday, which will make him 92 years young, old, however you want to, however Lynn, Lynn seems to be getting younger as he goes, uh, but he puts out a very clear, I won't say a birthday wish, because I don't think Lynn ever wishes for anything, I think he goes out and makes it happen, uh, but, it, but this would be also, coincidentally, the, the day, first day back for the Congress. And a very good day to have Boehner gone and Obama removed so that we can get on to business. And I, you know, I think what Phil went through was very sobering on uh, Lynn's view on this question of tragedy. And, and I think you know, each of us in our, in our own sense have, a, have an idea of what it is to organize our fellow American citizens right now and a kind of tragedy that, that most people uh, go through or live through, participate in, 
because of an inability to see clearly. And now, that doesn't mean we give up. That means we can push even harder. And, and I think you know, we just have to be clear that what, what Laney went through of a 40-year battle by Linda LaRouche, his wife Helga, uh, people like Laney and Phil that have been involved in this fight, especially with China, uh, and the fight for this organization in general, that we are at a point where this can come very rapidly, very, very suddenly. But it will come as we get the, the steel resolve to make it happen. So, and it's not an, a, a timeless fight. This situation is cracking apart at the seams right now. We don't have long before this entire derivatives bubble blows out. I mean, it's, it's in the process of blowing out. And what people think of as value is going to, it, it actually doesn't have any value now, but it will soon be that such on your bank statements, on your stock portfolio statements, on your gold bars that people think they have that represents value, and on your uh, housing price values. All those values are about to go through the floor because there's nothing behind it. And what I would like to get into with this presentation, which I'd like to present something on the question of value. I know Pat has uh, some more to add on this question of the drought, both the seen and unseen elements. And then Jason uh, Ross from the science research team will present a, you know, a picture of what, what it is that we're actually engaged in and working with these other nations to bring about a real renaissance for mankind. And I just want to say one thing on this because I, I have the opportunity to participate in the uh, Pacific Basin Nuclear Conference, which is a uh, you know basically top uh, nuclear engineers, scientists, policymakers on the question of nuclear power from the Pacific Basin. So in the United States, Canada, actually there was no one there from Russia, which I found. Interesting. They, they, could, they didn't even have Russians at their boost for Rosatom, which is their Russian uh, nuclear energy supplier, their uh, uh, company that builds nuclear power plants around the world, uh, which I think is obviously probably not disconnected from the political reality and the, the push for war, and Russia feels that, that pressure. Um, but then people from Japan, China, India, Taiwan, Vietnam, Australia. And one of the things that I found most um, interesting was in the dialogue with the participants from China. You know, there's a way where we can kind of romanticize what they're doing, or maybe not romanticize, but we want to give it a certain, uh, a certain gravity of what it represents, a certain power, and you know, uh, that, it, that it is profound thing that they are that they are up to. But for many of them, it was sort of interesting. The younger ones, it was, we're not going to do anything for thieves in the United States to hell with them. So he goes on to discuss this as a, as a science driver uh, program, and, and then comes back to the question of the four laws, and in particular, this notion of real value. Uh, the so-called productive powers of, of labor. It says, we must eliminate all of what we are used to as cheap labor and the practice of cheap labor in the United States. We must cancel all cheap labor programs. The only condition on which we can modify that policy is to say we're going to quickly do something to turn what is now cheap labor, non-productive labor, and to turn it as rapidly as possible into productive labor of a high energy flux density. If we don't do that, we're finished. If you do not follow my program, in short, you're finished. All those who, who are advocating lower energy de flux densities, lower productivities, they are your enemies. They are the people who are poisoning you. They are the people who are killing you. They are 
are killing your children just by doing that. This means that you need all kinds of health care also, because without the health care programs, with what goes with them, you cannot produce a highly productive situation. But all we need is to unite a group of nations on Earth together today with China and others who are cooperators on this thing to make things happen that increase the energy flux density of man's productive powers of labor. And anyone who's trying to do something to make it a little cheaper, to make it simpler, should in a sense be taken into a little room and talked to for a while. And I can tell you, I've been on the other side of the talking to of, of, of uh, Mr. LaRouche, and uh, it's not so fun. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so that's what I'd like to get at. What is this question of value? It's not an, uh, an unimportant question to ask right now because we're about to see the greatest wiping out of what people think of as values in the transatlantic system. On the other hand, we are beginning to see a concert of nations around the BRICS plus, 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 plus. It's like daily a, a pylon of more nations uh, that are joining the BRICS and the, and the New Development Bank, um, as Laney went through, you know, which is a direct outgrowth of what Lynn has done for this 40-year period. But we, we, do, we do see that there are now two uh, systems of balance. Hey, this is what we know. This is the culture that we've grown up with. Somebody who's 20 years old or you know, in their 20s is a nuclear uh, physics um, student has a sense that their life has been in a upward trajectory. And, and it was kind of like, well, what else would you do? <laughs> and for those in their 40s, 40s, early 50s, they had sort of known that China had made a, a, a transition. But, and they had a, a kind of a, a more, it was like, yes, we're doing this again, but what else would we do? But we, we have to do more because our people are, we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, is what the Chinese, what they were saying. It was, we have more people to pull out of poverty. We have more to do. And it, and it somewhat struck me that they're in the middle of this, and for them, it's, well, yeah, but we also have more to do. And, and I think, you know, what Phil brought up as the, the can't-do spirit, we do have to pull out and our fellow Americans, the residual that does lie, however beat down and buried it may be, especially with the last 14 years of fascism, uh, we have to pull that out of them. Now, what I'd like to do is just present uh, something on the question of value, because uh, Mr. LaRouche has recently called for a, an international series of conferences to discuss the notion of value. And I want to read what he responded um, in some discussions a, a few weeks back when he was asked on this. He says, on the question of these international conferences to discuss value, he said, if you are not dealing with China's thermonuclear capabilities, you are dead meat. Because only in what China represents so far China actually is collecting a source of thermonuclear power which is not available at this time to any other part of the planet Earth. And therefore, China's dominant role in terms of its thermonuclear capabilities is the leading force throughout the entire planet Earth right now. Now, there are other things that are relevant to that which are brought into play because of it. Once we get into cooperation with China on this moon project, the China Moon Project is the future of mankind. And it's only to the extent that we mobilize ourselves behind that and then look to other inferior means which can be mixed with the international thermonuclear capabilities to mix these capabilities and their applications and sort them out for the world as a whole.